in the lane, 15, 10, touchdown, Chargers! What's up, guys? Welcome into a brand new episode of Chargers Weekly. As always, joined by Matt Money Smith and Money OTAs, rookie minicamp uh, is in the rear view. We'll talk about what Brandon Staley had to say about the rookies and Justin Herbert throwing a football. But why, why don't you introduce our, our first guest, uh, a guy that we know really well? Yeah, one of our uh, one of our favorites. Even though, man, he and Trey made it tough on me. They wear the same color socks, the same color wristbands, same color shoes. <laughs> they had the long hair covering up their number, so they they'd make it tough if they were both in on a tackle trying to figure out which one was which. They maybe punch the ball out or something. They uh, but we we appreciate them. And look, we we say it all the time. There's certain positions on the field that can really break it down, and safety is certainly one of them. Uh, it's Jaleel Adai. With us, one of our favorites, uh, spanned a, a couple different coaching staff, so we're going to get into that. But uh, and someone who had to, to change positions actually to get it going. So Jaleel, thanks for for taking some time out here, man. It's great to see you. It's great to see you too, man. I appreciate you guys having me. Always good seeing you guys. Let's get to it. Jaleel's on the rise in the broadcasting ranks. Uh, I know you're doing total access at the end of the month, man, and. Uh, I know you're going to kill it and, and kind of make that natural progression into the broadcasting world, but uh, let's just start really top of mind with this Chargers team this offseason. Obviously, everybody's talking about how it ended, right? Being up 27 nothing and uh, losing that game. And I think you hear Sebastian Joseph Day and Derwin and all these guys who have talked after the season, there's a bad taste in their mouths. How can that maybe fuel them? for 2023 and, and just kind of your, your state of the team as we talk right now in May. Um, like, 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 like Derwin said, Joseph, Joseph Day said, anytime you lose a game like that, especially in the playoffs, being up by that much and then having a team come back and beat you in the way that the Jaguars did, especially being a defensive player, right? You're up. You know, so you think the game's in your hands. If they don't score, they don't win. Right. So like, like Derwin said, and those guys said, there's a bad taste in the mouth, and and, it's, and it could be good for them going into the off season. You know, it's going to fuel that extra drive that they need, um, doing OTAs, bring the camaraderie together, and say, hey guys, we we can't go out there and do what we did last year. We got to tighten up in those areas that we've seen that we we lacked we lacked in, and we got to continue to prove. And hopefully, that will be the next drive and the next, I'd say thing or situation that catapults the defense and the team overall into getting it deep into the playoffs next year and not letting that happen again. I would love to know, uh, Jaleel, just, I said it kind of when we, we brought you on, just you're, you know, it's hard enough to, to be a standout high school football player, but then you get to play division one football. And when you show up, they're like, yeah, we, we might have recruited you as a running back, but that ain't happening. And, and then they move you to wide receiver and they're like, yeah, and that ain't happening. So Take us through what that is, because you're you're an elite player. You think you're one of the best in the in the country, and all of a sudden they're telling you, "Well, no, we'd rather have you over here." How does that whole process go? How do you lean into that, and how do you excel at it? Yeah, for me it was difficult because I never played defense in my life. Y'all, I grew up in Florida. I played running back my whole life. I thought I was going to be the next Ward Dunn, Barry Sanders, Emmitt <laughs> Smith. I get to college. I'm there. I'm at the running back position for like two weeks. They moved me over to slot receiver. Um, and then it's one play in practice. They throw a screen to the running back, and I peel back on the defensive end, and I light them up. Uh, the, the older heads at the time didn't like that. They didn't like the way that I was practicing, right? But I was a young guy trying to make my name. I got moved around a couple times. Coach comes to me after practice, and he's like, hey, I like how you exploded through your hips. We're going to move you to defense. And, you know, me, I'm like, all right, coach. I'm Back in my mind, I'm like, defense? I've never played defense. My older brother is a safety at West Virginia, I uh, was coaching in college at the time. I called him. He gave me a couple pointers. First day of seven on seven, I go out there. I get two PBUs. I get a strip. And team, I get a strip. Um, so, I, I mean, needless, needless to say, I, I think it worked out well for me. But the mindset is like, as an athlete, right, you just you always feel like you're, you're going to compete at whatever it is. It doesn't matter if they tell you to go fill up the water bottle. It doesn't tell you if they tell you to go move the bags, right? You're going to compete. And that's what I did. I just competed. I, I, I didn't mope about it. Um, it's different nowadays. Guys can just enter the transfer portal. When I was coming out 11 years ago, you had to stick to it, yeah. stick, stick by your guns, right, and just compete and battle it out. And that's what I did. Well, I'd love to, uh, you know, I ask because, you know, they, they draft Diane Henley and he did the same thing, flip from one side to the other. So kind of take us through maybe what you then see differently that maybe guys that have been playing defense their whole lives, because I would assume they lean on you 
uh, seeing how well you excelled at the position, kind of asking you, okay, how do you approach this? What is it that that does for you as a player? Um, you just get to see both sides of the ball. For me, it was big because as a running back, right, you had to have vision when you're running through those holes. And when I was a safety and I dropped down into the box where I excelled the most was I, I it's almost like I seen the holes as if I was running. So I would be able to anticipate where the running back was going based off what I seen or felt because he was seeing the same thing. If there's an open gap, he sees it, he's going to hit it. If there's an open gap, I see it, I'm going to hit it. So I think that translated well for me going from running back to safety. Um, and just like anything, it's the same thing as if you're playing wide receiver, right? And then they move you to DB. You know that wide receivers like to stem you outside to bring you back inside to break back out for a corner route. So it's different things that you know that you've done in the past on the other side of the ball that you can use when you get to the other side to defend it and, and, and be successful at it. You, you know, Jaleel, I remember, uh, I think it was 2017. You started every game in 2017. That, that was Michael Davis's first year as an undrafted Free agent, Vato, right? Vato, mm-hmm. yeah. Vato. And, and and you know he he really worked his way up. I don't know. Ron Miles took him under his wing, Gus, and and he really established himself as a good player. Um, yeah. when, when Gus left, Brandon Staley comes in a completely different defense, and it took Michael, I think, the uh, all of Brandon's first year. Last year, we saw Michael Davis play better than almost any corner in the league. I mean, he yeah, was he playing was at, a, at a high level. I, I don't know if you could just speak to it. your your. Uh, experience playing with Michael and you know that that shift from what Gus did to this Vic Fangio Brandon Staley type defense and just how different that is right yeah um uh, what's crazy is I, I'm the one that actually gave Vato that that nickname when he came in as ah. a guy uh, so that's my guy man but I see Vato when he came in just a humble kid uh willing to learn no ego and one thing Vato can do is he can run, right? And Gus Bradley, they implemented that with him. Gus was big on staying on top, not letting the ball get over your head. And Mike, he excelled, right? He excelled in that defense. And then you see the switch come over with the with the um, Brandon Staley's defense, and they're playing more quarters, they're playing more man. And I think it just took Vato a little bit more time to, to get adjusted to it. Obviously, they brought J.C. Jackson over. They had Asante Samuels, you know, running with the ones, and Vato was a, a former starter who got pushed down the depth chart a little bit because of free agency, which happens in this business. Um, but once he got his feet back under him, and I think that he got more comfortable with the defense, you've seen him excel. Like you said, he played top ball last year, one of the best corners in the league uh, stat-wise, right, uh, with P. BU. So he did his thing, man. And I think this year he'll, he'll continue to do that and grow even more. Julio, when you, you kind of see these last couple of years and, and everybody sort of, and look, the, the numbers are what they are. It's right to take shots about the run defense. Give us an idea of, you know, what, how much has to go right for yeah. a defense to be able to stop the run and maybe what you've noticed and, and cause everybody just points to the line. They're like, well, you got to get better bodies inside, but you know, it's so much more than that, especially with the amount of tackles you would pile up. Like you right. said, reading the gaps and making those stops as a safety. The biggest thing I think is gap discipline, right? It starts up front. The, the defensive line sets the tempo. The defensive line sets the line of scrimmage, right? You want the def- your defensive line to play on their side of the ball. I think the only thing that, I, I seen a little bit with the charges with some guys jumping out of gaps or missing their gaps or linebackers not playing downhill fast enough. Um, they have the talent. The roster is there. Tom has done a great job over the years of building this roster. Um, I think the biggest thing is just gap integrity, right? Don't 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 be in this gap, sticking your head in this gap. Stay true. Trust the guy behind you that he's gonna the linebackers are gonna fill in. And then here comes Duran, who you know is gonna blow up anything that comes through the hole. Um, low, he has played well. So I think just playing more so as a group because the talent is there and trusting one another, I think they'll be fine. I think Brandon Staley will will, will fix that problem and the Chargers defense will really excel this season. Julia, w- w- they didn't do much of free agency, but one of the things they did on the defensive side of the ball was bring in Kendricks. Uh, mm-hmm. As a linebacker, you talk about shooting the gaps and, um, you know, we've heard Sebastian Joseph Day and Derek Ansley talk about the run defense and how it is really truly all three levels involved in, in making that thing work um what is Eric Kendricks going to bring to this Chargers defense like I said the defense the defense is going to excel and he's one of those main pieces why right he he, they brought him in for free agency and he's a he's a certified baller he's been balling since he's came into the league he's a downhill he's a downhill linebacker and what that will do is allow those double teams that are on the defensive lineman to come up sooner because he's coming he's playing downhill that way the defensive line will get more one-on-ones and in this league it's all about your one-on-ones who wins their one-on-one battles and like I said this defense is loaded their front four is loaded and I don't think anybody in this league wants to block these guys one-on-one so I think having him um come in as a leader 
uh, what he brings with his physical attributes, playing downhill, that'll free up some more guys down there in the front so they can make more TFLs and control that line of scrimmage. So I'm uh, I'm looking at the schedule, Jaleel, and it's uh, Green Bay, November 19th, New England, December 3rd, Denver, December 31st. Uh, as someone from, from Florida who had to go make your bones up in, in central Michigan, <laughs> how big of a deal is the cold? Like when you're a warm weather person, the Chargers right. are a warm weather team. Like it's how good. big of a deal is that when you got to go play 60 minutes outdoors in December in New England? Uh, I can tell you it's tough. Like you said, coming from Florida, playing in Michigan, um, playing with the Chargers, you know, we got this beautiful weather, 75 and sunny year round. Then we got to go play at places like Arrowhead in December, places like the Patriots, we, like we did in the second round in 2018. And there's a difference, right? There's a difference. It's colder. Your muscles are tighter. You're not used to it. Those guys are out there in short sleeves and we're coming out in long sleeves. Um, but like I said, there's a lot of experience on this team. Um, I think they'll be fine. They, they got to lean on their running game when you get into those cold weather games. The ball gets slick. It's hard. Um, it, it's hard to pass in those games. So you got to lean on that running game. Austin Eckler, that, that offensive line that Tom has invested in, has to show up in those kind of games. And I think they will. Uh, so I don't think it'll be that big of a deal. Hey, Chris, hold on. I want to jump in because he brought it up. I would love to know if you felt the same thing we did in the booth in that 2018 playoff game. And yep. just kind of how you guys were trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Coin toss, Patriots win, and they take the ball. And yeah. we went, whoa. What, yeah. what, what, what did they figure? What do they got up their sleeve? Like, what is it about this defense that they figured out that they feel mm -hmm. like, we want the ball first and we're going to go score? Right. What was going on that day? And, like, what was it that made it so tough that they had kind of put on you guys? It was I freezing, too, by the way, Jill. It, it, it was freezing. 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 Granted, we jumped out on them. It was, it, we were the first – First quarter, we were we were in it with them. Keenan hit yeah. Gilmore with a double move, a dig and go. Um, we we walked into that game as confident as ever, like we were going to beat them, and we felt that way. The week before, we stopped Lamar with seven DBs, run one of the most predominant rushing attack offenses yeah. you're going to see in the league. Right? I think they did that more so, like, hey, we're going to try to set the tempo, we're going to set we're going to set the precedence for today, um, and they did that. They did a good job of establishing the run. Um, and once they did that, we were playing downhill, downhill, and then here comes the power power pass, right? They're faking the power pass and over the top with Edelman and, and Gronk. So it was a tough, it was a tough slate. It was a tough day. It was a tough day in the second half, and they just had our number that day, man. I always tell people that was our year. I felt that we were going to hit that Super Bowl, but we ran into a guy by the name of Tom Brady. <laughs> Damn Tom yeah. Brady. Damn Tom Brady. It. Hey, Damn you know, Julius, speaking of that 2018 team, I mean, you guys, people forget, you guys were pretty dominant. 12-4. Um, you started every game, and you started every game beside uh, a rookie named Derwin James. Mm -hmm. You were you. I remember you and AP and a lot of those guys, veterans in that secondary, were really instrumental in coaching Derwin up and, and and making sure he was ready to go. But obviously, Derwin is Derwin too. Sure. What was it like playing with him his rookie year, where he was a first team All Pro? Man, that dude's a generational talent. I, I say it all the time. Everyone asks me, man, is Duren really that good? Duren's that damn good. Like, he's the best safety in the league. I mean, there's no argument. Um, but just seeing him coming, I'm, I'm from Florida. I was a Florida State fan growing up. I watched him in college when um, he came. And the biggest thing with him is a lot of people talk and harp on his mm -hmm. physical attributes. But the guy is smart, right? He's smart. He's willing to learn. He's a phenomenal leader. Um, and he just wants to be the best. He's, he's, he has God-given talent. But there's a lot of people who have God-given talent but don't work, right? Don't work how he works or, or don't take on, don't take his craft as, their craft as serious as he does. And he does, man. He wants to be the best. You see, he says 1% every day, and he really means it, man. He's trying to get better every single day, and it shows on Sunday. He's the heartbeat of that defense, heartbeat of the team, if you ask me, right? As he goes, they go. When he's not out there, it, there's a, it's a difference in – and he, he's one to watch, man. He's excited to watch for the next 10 plus years. Jaleel, coming out of this this first round of, of OTAs and, and rookie camp and all that, um, a lot of questions, uh, Derek Ansley, the, the new DC, uh, about JT Woods. And, you know, here's a third round yeah. pick that just couldn't get on the field right. last year. And, and you know, they could have used him. I mean, they absolutely could have. So, and a lot of the questions surrounded instincts and vision. And, you know, the productions there. The guy had six interceptions at Baylor. So maybe right. if, if you can kind of take us through your, your observations and, and in that particular position, you know, I know you played strong most of the time, but, but, playing free as a rookie and how much goes into that responsibility and trying to get acclimated as a rookie it's a lot because these quarterbacks in this league are they're elite right and they can manipulate you with their eyes with their shoulders right and one false step in this league you're burnt 
Um, like you said, in college, he, he, he showed that he's a ball hawk. Um, in training camp, he was showing that he was a ball hawk. And there is a learning curve, right? And I think that he had to go through that. May have hit a rookie wall. I'm not sure. I wasn't in the building. Um, but I think this year is going to be him and Alohi who battled it out in training camp. Um, for that starter spot next to Derwin. The kid is physical. Uh, he's tall. But I like Alohi too, man. It's going to be a great camp to watch. That's going to be one of the most important um, camp battles that we see is him and Alohi going at it for that starting spot. Jill, what do you make of the way Alohi has played? Um, and, you know, I, I see him as a guy who has stuck around. Um, his work ethic speaks for itself. Yeah. And he made he made plays in, in games, uh, two in particular that stick out is the one – First play of the game against the Dolphins, where yeah. he, he breaks up the, the Tyree Kill bomb, um, which could have, you know, the game could have gone the other way had, had that right. had that uh, converted. Uh, the other one was the interception in Cleveland. Like he, mm -hmm. he he seems to be at the right place at the right time. Um, nothing flashy, yeah. but seemed to be a, a really nice compliment to Derwin. He's a real good compliment to Derwin. Like you said, you harped on that first play with Tyreek, who's a world-class sprinter, who's taking guys deep for a living, right? And the funny thing about it is the Dolphins drew that play up just for him to be on Alohi. Alohi stepped yep. up to the plate, beat ball, didn't panic, made the play, and then let them know, not today, right? Y'all aren't bringing that to me. And yep. and honestly, they didn't try him after that. But like you said, in Cleveland on the goal line, uh, just, just mirroring the eyes of Jacoby and picks him off. Um, when I was there, he, he's made plays. Just seeing him as a young kid and, and how he's come in and how he's continued to grow and grow and grow. Like you said, nothing flashy, um, not the biggest, not the fastest, but he's in the right place at the right time. He's smart and he's durable and the coaches can depend on him. When the coach can depend on you, you will play a long time in this league and they feel comfortable with you out there. So I think Alohi's going to ball this year. Like I said, interesting to see who wins that battle in camp. Yeah, you just retired, Jaleel, so you had a chance to get a crack at Patrick Mahomes multiple times. Give us an idea of, of what – you talked about damn Tom Brady. Like, what, yeah. what does Patrick Mahomes present to an opposing defense? It's, it's Patrick and it's Andy at the same time. Like, those guys are two geniuses together, but you can prepare for them on Monday – through Sunday, all the way up until the game. Uh, prepare for the different formations they're going to throw at you, the different personnels. But once you get out there, it's backyard football. Patrick steps back. He looks. He doesn't see it. Now he's running around, and you're, it's a scramble drill. You're chasing Kelsey. You're chasing Tyreek Hill back in the day. You're chasing all these guys around, and Patrick just makes it happen. He can make any throw on the field from any unorthodox position. Sidearm, no look. Uh, he's like Magic Johnson of football, man. He can deliver however he wants to, and that's what he brings, and that's one of the biggest threats when you're playing him is just those guys are never out of the game. No matter how much you think that you know them or you got them, you don't. J Julia, the, the balance of power, it's really unbalanced when we talk about the, the quarterback playing the AFC versus the yeah. NFC. Um, I, I know I heard you say it, you think the Chargers have a legit shot to dethrone the Chiefs, and obviously yeah. they need to prove that. But um, w when you look at all the quarterbacks that this team is going to have to face, from Mahomes yeah. twice to Russell Wilson twice, if Peyton can get him right, to Lamar Jackson, um, to Josh Allen, you know, yeah. all, all these guys, Aaron Rodgers, um, how difficult is it going to be in the AFC just to make the playoffs? And, you know, Money and I have talked countless times about, like, you know, 10, 11 teams that have a legit shot to make the playoffs based on just the quarterback that they have under center. Right. Yeah, when you're in this league, you always have a chance when you have a quarterback like these guys do. Like you said, you're, you're, you're naming off names who are Pro Bowl, All Pros, future Hall of Famers that these guys are going to have to see week in and week out. I think the biggest thing is that they have to stay healthy. Whichever team stays the most healthy – uh, this season, I think, will be one of the teams who give themselves the best shot of making it out of the AFC to make it into the playoffs. Um, other than that, you just got to be on top of your game. There's not one single game in the NFL, or especially with the rosters, the, the schedule, excuse me, that they have this year, that you can just roll the ball out and say, hey, we're going to win today. Everyone has to be dialed in, offense, defense, special teams, especially the defense with these quarterbacks they're playing. And like I said, Herbert is elite. He's top five, in my opinion, and he'll go blow for blow with any quarterback in this league so I think having him is is obviously a bonus but they got to be on top of it and be prepared week in and week out 
Give us, um, Jaleel, you made the team as a, an undrafted free agent, and you, you always hear, you know, guys that take your path, you, you got to make it on special teams. Absolutely. How do you make a team on special teams? Like, what is it that you do that separates you for them to say, yeah, we're going to give him one of our 53 spots because of what he showed us on special teams? First of all, you got to go, it, special team, you have to have a different mindset. Offense and defense, we all want to play offense and defense, right? Special teams, you have to have an unselfish mindset, kickoff, kickoff return, uh, these are all high impact plays. Everyone's running from 15 to 20 yards. You can't shy away from any contact. You got to be a bullet out there. You have to show that you have no care for your body in a sense, right? You have to give it up for the team. You have to be an unselfish player. And I think that's the biggest thing for rookies. When you come in, you're the all-star when you leave college, right? You're the you're the big man on campus. But when you come to the league, especially if you're an undrafted guy, you're the small fry. And you got to prove yourself in the way you prove yourself with special teams, going down on kickoff, making tackles inside the 20, blocking punts, you know, on kickoff return, getting getting back to your drop, setting up. If you have a one-on-one -on -one block, staying with your one-on-one -on -one block. If you have a double team, driving that guy out of there to create a lane for the kickoff returner or punt returner. So it's things like that. You got to show up and you got to flash on film on special teams for those coaches to say, hey, this is one of the guys that we got to keep on this roster. Jaleel, we were cheated last year of seeing Mike Williams in, in the playoffs. We were cheated yeah. of seeing Keenan Allen for a majority uh, or a big chunk of the first half of the season. Um, you went up against those guys on, yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when Mike and Keenan are at full strength, and you just, you know, we talk about these other weapons, uh, Quentin Johnson, who they drafted in the first round, Joshua Palmer, uh, Gerald yeah. Everett. I mean, Justin yeah. Herbert's got a ton of weapons, but just Mike and Keenan in particular, I mean, you came yeah. in with Keenan, so you've seen him from the beginning. Yeah, yeah I have, and, and like you said, Mike and Keenan, when you talk about them two, when they're both healthy, they're the best combo in the league. And I've argued guys down about that. Mike can catch any deep ball. He's not a 50-50 guy. It's more 75-25. Keenan can line up on the outside, inside. When the best route runner in the league. Him him and Devontae Adams, I give those guys 1A, 1B. Um, so those guys right there are special. And when you give Herbert who's an elite quarterback with the arm like that. And then you add those other pieces in there. You, you, and one person that the guy, a lot of people have forgot about, everyone wants to say we want speed, we want speed. Jalen Guyton is a guy who is, has speed. He's a guy who can stretch the field. Obviously, he's coming off of ACL. But I think they have everything that they need for Kellen Moore to make this offense go at that wide receiver position. And it's going to be special to watch. Um Last one from me, Julia. We appreciate the time, man. Um, I would say I know you're busy, but I don't know if you are. Uh, and that's why I'm, I'm asking you this question. It's, it's such a weird profession. You know, you're, you're 33 years old, man. It's like you, you, you've got your entire life ahead of you and you've already lived a professional life, a, a decade in the league and, you know, playing at a high level and, and getting a big contract and all that sort of stuff, all that great success. But then it's almost like it just, just yeah. spits you out. Because yeah. you're, you're on this, right? Because you're on this regimen and That's everything true. is laid out for you. And now life is uh, just kind of there and you got to figure it out. What is, figure it out. just share with the people, like what, what that is like to have this incredible career doing this incredible job. And then you're done at 33. Yeah, done at 33, man. Like you said, it goes by that fast, almost a decade in the league. Um, and it's, it's a transition. and Everybody goes through it. It doesn't matter if you play three years, five years, 15 years. Uh, it's a transition. And my biggest thing is, I would tell players when you when you're when you're playing, always have a plan, right? And, and it sounds cliche, have a plan, plan B, or but it's true because you always think as a player, I will never be done, I'll never be done. Then it goes by that fast. Uh, for me, obviously, I'm transitioning to broadcasting. Um, I'm doing uh, real estate. I, I've dove into real estate, and one of the biggest things for me is that helped me a lot with my transition. Like the money's, like you said, contract. You played. You you've accomplished your dream, you made big money in the NFL. But the biggest thing for me that has been a blessing to me is my family, my wife, uh, Lindsay, uh, my three kids, Zion, Zaire, and Zuri. Um, that's who I pour myself into now with sports. You know, we're doing sports, we're doing travel, we're doing school things. So that's been the biggest blessing for me, man. It's actually taken a lot of the, the transition toll off of me. I, I can say that it's my family that's been the biggest, the biggest blessing for me. Money, you know what? <laughs> Guys get drafted and they play in the league for a long time, but uh, Julia, you're different, man. Yeah. You like, first of all, you're the utmost professional, right? But to to be undrafted and to stick in the league for as yeah. long as you did, you know, during different coaching staffs, mm -hmm. it, it it just it it says something about you, right? That you're you're the type of guy 
that they needed on that team to succeed. And I remember firsthand, like, you know, when, when the Anthony Lynn era started, I mean, you were a big part of that in terms of the leadership in the locker room. So I just want to commend you because I think it's, it's it's one, it's one thing to, to be in the league for a few years, get drafted and then kind of find the next thing. But I mean, the, how you created your own success, not many people in the league can do that. You know, Austin Eckler is another example of that, right? Yeah, a guy who was undrafted and, and made the most of it. Yeah. Um, so just to get you out of here on this, that, that next, uh, uh, endeavor is, is broadcasting. You just told me you're going to be on total access, right? In, in June or when, when is that? Tell us about that. Uh, yeah. So I did a three day boot camp with the NFL network, uh, got some good feedback uh, and they invited me back out as a guest analyst for the whole week on total access, May 29th, I think through June 2nd or June 3rd. So I'll be on there live doing my thing, suited and booted. Uh, 4 p.m. Central, no, 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 right. p.m. Eastern time. So if y'all ain't doing nothing, check me out. Let me know. There we go. Where else? What, what Can we find you anywhere else, Julio? Outside of that, uh, that one week, what else you got? Uh, I got the NFL Total Access. I'm doing some stuff locally here in San Diego at NBC San Diego, Fox 5. Um, actually, in June, I'll be out there with you guys. I think I'm going to be with you, Chris, uh, June 12th, covering the media day for the Chargers. So Love it. I'm just getting my whistle wet, man. I'm just getting started. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> And I'm passionate about it, so we'll see where it takes me. Beautiful. I love it. Chargers fans are going to see a lot it. of Julio die, man. Hey, it was so great catching up. And like, like I said, your, your insight as a player and, and playing with so many guys on this current roster, it, it really brings a lot to light yeah. in terms of what to expect in 2023, man. So we, we, uh, we appreciate your time and look forward to more analysis throughout the offseason. Sounds good. Thank you for having me, guys. Thanks, Julio. All right. Well, buddy, I love when we talk to former players, especially former players that know so many of the key guys and key contributors on this 2023 Chargers team. Yeah, and look, safety, he said it. You know, that's going to be a big one because they, you, you don't, we, we've said this before, you don't draft guys in the third round and <laughs> expect them to be fringe special teams players and not make their way into the rotation on either the offense or the defensive side of the ball. So, they're expecting a lot out of JT Woods. I know we're going to get into it. And, and that was one of, it felt like, if not the, it was darn close to the most discussed topic with, with new D.C. Derek Ansley uh, about what, what the vision is and what the expectations are for JT. So great to get a little bit of insight there from Jaleel about, and, and he hit it on the head. He's absolutely right. Guy had, what, six interceptions at Baylor his senior year. It came into the, you know, led, led the NCAA comes in, shows out in training camp, has a solid run a little bit there in the preseason, and then, for whatever reason, just got away from him and did not get himself a lot of playing time. And it was like 30-something snaps, and some of those were emergency snaps. So that, to me, is one of the big camp questions and, and one that no doubt the Chargers would love to see answered with JT Woods working his way as a starter on this defense. We should start there, uh you know, I, I a list of a few things that I thought were the, the key takeaways. Yeah. Brandon Staley was asked about JT Woods. Derek Ansley was asked about JT Woods. And, you know, we, we talked about Alohi Gilman and kind of the steadiness that, that he's brought to that secondary. And I thought he was a pleasant surprise last year, frankly. But but you don't draft 100%. a guy, like you said, the third round to, to sit on the to sit on the bench. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. I mean, I'm pulling it up right now just to, to give you an idea of, of who got taken in that third round and how much they're playing as you go through it. Chad Muma, you know, playing for the Jags. We know we saw him in the playoff game, a linebacker there. Uh, Vellis Jones didn't have a great year, but the Bears tried to put him in to that, that rotation. Jelani Woods became the starting tight end in, in Indianapolis. Desmond Ritter, quarterback for the Falcons, ends up starting the final four games. I mean, when you go through it, Greg Dulcich, we saw how big of an impact he had in Week 18 against the Chargers as the tight end in Denver. These are third-round picks. N'Kobe Dean for Philadelphia, of course, that he slipped because of the injury, but you know what the expectations are there. Like, third round, you got to play. Third round, you expect for these guys to be big contributors, and that's why... You know, and that's look, that's how it is this year. When you talk about Tui Tui Lapalotu in the second and Henley in the third, we expect those guys to play this year beyond go. beyond special teams. Yeah, Henley's a special teams stud, and, and they expect him to be, and that was a, another sort of theme of of conversation surrounding the questions asked to coaches, but Coach Ficken and, and Coach Staley with with Henley, but 
they they expect those guys to contribute this year on defense, and, and no doubt that's what they're going to want to see from JT Woods is that he's able to take that step. You put JT Woods in that in that uh, conversation. He's almost like a red shirt rookie, right? He, he was. He's got, he's got to play. Um, they they asked about Thule and and if it was going to be uh, maybe a, a learning curve because he's twenty years old. And I loved Ansley's answer. He said, "This guy is uh, wise beyond his years, so it's it's yeah. it's not that um, he should be ready to go." And, you know, the fact that he is 20, I think, is frankly exciting because I, I do think that when you're in a room with Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa and uh, playing the football he's already played, um, he's going to make an impact. And I, I have no doubt that I think him and Henley are both going to play and play a decent amount, especially Tui Pelotu when we talk about uh, that edge position because I think he's automatically that, that number three edge rusher right now, Money. No doubt. And, and to your point, it was a great answer from, from Ansley because he's spot on. Age, age can be a thing. We saw it last year with Isaiah Spiller, just from a growth and a strength yep. and a body type standpoint. But you look at Tui Pelotu, and he looks like an NFL player. When you looked at Isaiah Spiller, you were like, man, dude looks like a baby out there. So there's a difference. And people can, you know, they mature. Their, their bodies are, are built differently. And certainly Tui Pelotu. And it'll be interesting to see how they – envision him do they want him to get lighter do they want him to get heavier do they like him exactly where he is do they want to put him inside he can play up and down the line and he's got the body where however you want him to be most effective he can do that so it'll be interesting to see how they how they deploy him the the different ways they deploy him but no doubt he's and it was great to see him out there and it was great to see all the rookies out there, the undrafted free agents out there. It's just fun to, to see dudes live their dreams and, and realize their dreams and, and just have that pep in their step as, as they put on that Charger helmet for the first time and, and get coached up by these NFL coaches for the first time. Not to mention having Justin Herbert out there working out next to him, throwing around was pretty damn great to see. Yeah, that, that was probably the lead among all fans is that Justin Herbert's throwing the football in, in May. And, you know, it's it's a big deal because he had that, that offseason surgery. But w- when he's slinging it around the way he was to, to Quentin Johnston, uh, which the Chargers put on their social media the other day, uh, I think things are good. So I, I, I don't think there's any worry that Justin Herbert's going to be ready to go. Love that all the rookies and Tui Peloto will get done. But love that the contracts are done. Get that, yep. just wipe that off the table we know in years past, you've had a couple of hiccups here and there, guys holding out until the day before training camp or something. Get the sense that that is not going to be the case this year, specifically with Quentin, just because they expect a lot out of him. He's your first round pick, and that's the one that typically takes the longest to get sorted out. So very happy that that's squared away and that he was out there and he is full speed ahead, ready to roll. And I'll tell you, there were some shots that I got excited Kind of seeing the seeing the hands out in front of them, snatching those balls out the air got me a little. I'm like, okay, here we go. No, nah, it's not when you got contact and you're feeling contact, and that's typically when your muscle memory comes into play. But I'll take it. I'll take it for now. What I thought was cool, and you know, take this for what it's worth, I, I just think it, it's uh, a reflection of the locker room and I think kind of the culture is the fact that uh, Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, and Joshua Palmer went up to the hotel to introduce themselves to, to Quentin and get yeah. to know him a little bit. Very I, cool. I just think that that, they don't that have to kind do of that. stuff is it, – it matters. Um, 100%. It's, he's, he's going into a room with guys who have done it at the highest level. And for a guy like Joshua Palmer, who's kind of on that same track that Quentin is, he's got a couple of years learning from Keenan and Mike. Um, but just to kind of be welcomed in to the wide receivers room like that, I think that little stuff matters. The other thing, just shifting from – wide receiver to a wide receiver, but really more of a returner. I really liked what Coach Ficken had to say about Darius Davis because there's there's a there's certainly a segment of scouting society that says eh, more and more with you know, teams are just content to kick the ball out of the back of the end zone. You don't have returns like you used to. Punters have become so good that hang time becomes such a weapon that you're barely returning any punts now. And Coach Ficken had a a perfect response to that. He specifically pointed out, it's what we like about this guy, is he is one of the few that is, he, he called him the best returner in college football. He's like, this is one of the few guys who 
doesn't get phased by bodies flying around him. He trusts his blocks are going to be there, and he's returning punts that other guys perhaps wouldn't. So it speaks to something they saw in, in Darius Davis that they did not see anywhere else and were willing to pay a premium for that, a, a fourth-round pick, as opposed to wait until the fifth or sixth or seventh to get a returner because of how diminished that particular position has become. And it was exciting to hear, no, we, we expect this guy to return punts, that other guys wouldn't, and that's why he's here. And, and we know how important that was last year in a number of games when DeAndre Carter's giving you that extra 10, 12, a couple, gosh, I, I'm blanking on it right now. If I had the schedule in front of me, I would probably, was it the Miami game that he had the big return that set up the, the maybe it wasn't Miami, darn it. Mm. What? I can't remember what game it was, but it was a tight game. Was it Tennessee? It was a tight game, and he had a big punt return that set up the game-winning field goal. It was like a 50-something yard was it maybe, Atlanta? Maybe it was, it was, maybe it was it Tennessee was, because uh, didn't Justin had that big strike to Mike Williams to set up the field goal, right? Right. So that was a big strike. So it wouldn't have been Tennessee because that was the big toss well, from from Justin on the um, – ah, my bad. I should – that's what happens when I just go stream of consciousness. I make a hey, fool of myself. <laughs> no, it's because I can't even think about it. You, you know what I was going to say, though? Because uh, you were in the booth for it. I remember when the sky was falling special teams wise in August against the Cowboys and it was just a disaster. Um, Cavante Turpin. Yes. In the TCU returner receiver. That's right. right? So the, the, the chargers got their Philip Turpin in the, in the uh, uh, preseason uh, uh, frog. And then uh, they, they drafted one. They said, let's get one of our own. (laughs) That could maybe flip the field for us. Exactly. Right. Um, are you still looking? You're not looking up at that DeAndre Carter thing, are you? I can't. I was, and I just gave up because it wasn't. Okay. It wasn't. Miami was the long drive to get the field goal. It consumed like ten minutes. Tennessee I'm sorry, was the, Den- the big play. Denver was the muff punt. That was the uh, Jasir Taylor game. Um, Denver was the muff punt. Perhaps it was. At uh, man, nah, I'm like I said, I am doing myself no favors right now because I'll have to I'd have to dig someone in the comments hey the people the people that are listening they know they no know and I my old brain is all salt water logged and it can't freaking process memories anymore so my great apologies folks I'm yeah. sure you remember the game I'm talking about and I don't I don't sleep I don't I won't really I don't know there's sleep, that right sleep is either um, <laughs> and there's uh, exactly that I, I wanted to end on this I, I I kind of alluded to it with Jaleel at the end but the 27 to nothing thing's not going away uh, among the players. Uh, Sebastian Joseph Day talked right. about it. Um, no. I, and, I, and I say that I think is a, is a good thing. Uh, I, I think that this is going to be something that is really going to stick with them. Now, it's, it's a matter of if you, Got you it. channel it. Right? Go, Arizona. Go Arizona. It was Arizona. Remember, they're down 24-17 with two minutes left, and they punt. Uh, they punt. And it is a that was an overtime. That was an overtime game. That was the no. They went for two. Oh, that was the go, go for two game. That yes. Go so it was a fifty yard punt. DeAndre Carter twenty yard return to the Arizona forty three and gets hit out of bounds. So or and there's a player out of bounds penalty adds another five yards. They get the ball with a minute forty eight left. Go down. Score go with fifteen two. seconds yeah. left. Go for two. Win the game. That saved and the that season. And that was, that was set, saved the season. And that was set up by DeAndre Carter's 20-yard punt return that put them at the Arizona 43 to get that drive started. I honestly don't think they would have made the playoffs had they lost that game. I really don't. I agree. I, I, th- I think I think I agree. They would have been five and six. And it just the the sting of losing that game, I think I don't know if they would have made the postseason had they lost that game. I thought that was, yeah, it was the one you – well, they had lost. Remember, they had lost San Francisco, Kansas City prior, so they were staring at a three-game losing streak. Yeah, and it, it would have been because, and they lost against Las Vegas the next week, and we thought, oh boy. And then you're staring at Miami and all that speed on Sunday Night Football, and it's like, hey, you're six and seven, and then you go to Tennessee. I don't know. You know, it was whew, it was a roller coaster. But I, I do, I do think that this, this whole Jacksonville thing is is going to fuel a lot of the players. That, that had to live through that because, you know, Sebastian even said 
He's never lost like that. Derwin's in the locker room. He's never lost like that. Heck, um, it's hard so to lose like that. It's 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 hard to lose like that. It, it, I, I was just trying to think of like comparisons of you know even another sport like has a team like kind of used something devastating and come back and used it and actually won and got to the top of the mountain. You know well, what I thought about I, I UVA hate, losing to the, the UVA 16 seed losing to, uh, sure was it, it was come back and win the next year. Yeah, they they won it all after losing Maryland, to the Baltimore seed. County. They lost to yeah yeah UMBC. That's right. Yeah. The, yeah. the social media guy got uh, got his 15 minutes of fame that night. Exactly. I wish but it's possible. Listen, I, I, would, I, I, do think I hope having so. A negative, uh, having a negative channeling into a positive this offseason. I hope so. I Unfortunately, I feel like in the NFL, there's more <laughs> there's more situations that you have a bad event and everything just unravels from there. We know about the loser of the Super Bowl, how routinely they have a terrible following season. I look back to last year and you think about 13 seconds. How in the heck did the Bills figure out how to lose to Kansas City in that, in that divisional round? And, and then what happens? They come back this year and they lose in the divisional round at home. Obviously, a lot of circumstances surrounding the Bills sure. from last season sure. and what they went through. But feel like more uh, yeah well I mean there was the San Francisco muffed punt when Harbaugh was the coach and Kaepernick was the quarterback remember they lost essentially I think that was the NFC championship game that they lost on that muffed punt and the very next year they went to the Super Bowl so it's possible that you can use uh, you know a, a dramatic loss as motivation going into the next year feeling like you have unfinished business that, that somehow something was taken from you that you feel like was yours and you play that dominant of a first half and somehow you, you can't get out of there with a win to get another crack at Kansas City who you played better than anybody else in the league all season long. So I hope it is. You know, look, it's better than the guys saying, yeah, I don't care. It yeah. doesn't bother me. <laughs> it's, it's much better to hear Sebastian say, I think about it all the time. It, it, it haunts me. I just me. think defensively money, uh, and Sebastian brought up this point, like the, it was the first year a lot of those guys had played together. You know, right. he, he mentioned guys uh, like Derwin and Kenneth Murray and uh, himself, Austin Johnson, who got hurt, Morgan Fox, uh, Michael Davis. So another year together in this defense, uh, a new voice as a defensive coordinator in Derek Ansley. Who knows what that brings? And just more familiarity uh, as a unit. Um, maybe get maybe having Joey for for a majority of the year. Yeah, Khalil, I think help. <laughs> you know, I, I, all all those things, and then you know, obviously the rookies that we talked about, the redshirt rookies that we talked about uh, contributing this year. So uh, defensively, I I think it, it's more there's more of an urgency on the defensive side of the ball to drastically improve um, as opposed to the offense. I know with with Kellen Moore coming in, obviously things are going to change. Um, I don't envision Justin Herbert not scoring points. I don't care who's calling the offense. But I do think right. Kellen, Moore's, Kellen Moore is going to, to make a difference. But I think really the onus is on the defense to drastically improve the, the run D specifically. And, you know, all those guys talked about taking all three levels of the defense to do that. And just, you know, taking the ball away, scoring on defense. All the things that I think we, we expected this defense to look like last year, it needs to look more that way in 2023. No doubt. You hit it on the head. The, the offense you feel great about. You've got weapons everywhere. You've got a dominant offensive line. You've got one of the best quarterbacks in the league. Defense, we forget how good it could have been because of all the injuries. You, you've got two all pros, Joey Bosa and J.C. Jackson, that essentially missed the entire season for all intents and purposes. So how much better can that look when you have Joey Bosa and J.C. Jackson out there? And, and that was the other exciting thing uh, about the, the media availability is is JC and and Derek talking about I feel like I'm gonna be ready for week one like just that man they're gonna amazing. need them they that need that amazing. big body and that physical matchup to step out you know step opposite Jalen Waddle or Tyreek Hill pick one and get after it so that that's that was very encouraging I did not think that that would be the timeline he'd share usually you don't want to share timelines at all because all you can do is you know fall short of them if you come back early people get excited 
that you come back late, people get upset. You know, look at look at Keenan, look at Joey. I mean, it's it's why it's so hard to do the timeline thing. Remember when Rashawn was talking about coming back and like, oh, he might back for Jacksonville, and Coach Staley was like, eh, let's slow down. If he's out there, great. I mean, it's probably not going to happen though because you don't want to have a letdown there, and you and obviously you don't want a guy to try to rush himself back if he, it's it's only going to make things worse. So, but that was ex- very exciting to hear. The expectations for JC have done like a complete 180, right? Like last year, it's like this guy had the most picks in football the last couple of years. He's going to, you know, he's going to lead the league in interceptions again. Right now, I don't think you can even put it in your brain to, to count on him right away. But if right. you can, I mean, that's a heck of a bonus. You know, you talk about uh, the corners and you can never have enough corners. They have guys to, to roll out there week one that are pretty darn good. Yeah. If you can add a healthy J.C. Jackson to the mix and he can be the guy that you, you assigned him to be, man, now, now we're talking about a completely different defense. Huge. Absolutely huge. You're talking about all three levels and being able to take away the team's number one weapon. Yeah. And, that's, and that was the adjustment that they made with J.C. right before he got hurt, and he started playing well. He did not have a good start to the season. He was playing horrible. And – talking about the adjustment I just struggling with the scheme and finally they were like just go follow that guy and he did and it was like yeah that's that's what he does so to have that week one against Tyree Killer Jalen Waddle to have it against you know week two week three week three against Justin Jefferson in Minnesota week four against Devontae Adams to be able to just put that guy there this is yours Go to work. A huge advantage. One more for you. Dalvin Cook is going to get released. Mm -hmm. He went to Florida State. We got some Mm -hmm. Knowles on this team. Sure. Um, As we kind of wait for this Austin Eckler thing to unfold, would Dalvin Cook be a name that you would consider if things go in a different direction with Austin? Look, yeah, it'd be great to have him. I just... I feel like he's in the same boat as Austin Eckler, and that is someone who wants money and a lot yeah. of it. And the Vikings are essentially saying to Dalvin very similar things to the the Chargers saying to Austin, we love you, we appreciate you, you're an important part of this team, but we can't do that. And word is he he doesn't want – you look at the numbers that, that you've heard, and it it's like that just doesn't line up. It's And for his agent, that's what people forget is – it's not just the player, it's the financial team around the player. You, you can't have an agent, the, the agent will refuse to do a low money deal because of how it looks for the agent. It's they, they want as much money as possible. So I'm assuming the Vikings are saying, hey, we'll bring you back, but it's got to be at this number. And you know, that's going to be a decent number. It's not going to be a couple million bucks. It, it may not be $14 million or $12 million, but it could be eight or $9 million bucks seven or eight million dollars and that's just not something that's in the cards for the chargers i would guess with the the money that they're going to have to dole out to justin herbert and and i'm still waiting for him to do a little bargain shop in here with with some of the talent that's still out there we've talked still about it not out there leonard floyd yannick and bryce callahan and slot you know those those are not those are not development inhibitors uh, as bill parcells would call them those those are not vets that are taking reps away from young players that you want to develop and are probably better just inexperienced than the vets those are good vets that can add to a team and it'll be interesting to see how long they're sitting out there waiting for all that cash that that isn't going to come now there's post june 1st cuts when you can make those moves and once those happen and teams are able to get some big money contracts off their books because they take less of a cap hit after june 1st then is that that's that next wave. So that's sort of what we're waiting for here, Chris, these next 14 days to see what those June, June 1st cuts are, who's going to have some money to spend and what these free agents that are still out there are, are willing to settle for. Yep. Just remember Chargers made a lot of these moves after the draft last year with, uh, with Morgan Fox and Kyle Van Noy. Yeah. And, you know, Kyle's another name that's out there, but I think, you know, when you, when you draft exactly. a guy like, when you draft a guy like Thule, I guess it's just a matter of what Kyle's going to want as a veteran and and how the money lines up. No doubt. We'll see. It's May 17th. Uh, Like you said, money in in a couple of weeks after June 1st, I think there'll be a little bit more action around the league in terms of uh, uh, player movement. But um, 
Uh, we appreciate Jaleel Adai coming yeah. on and joining us, seeing an old friend. And uh, we'll, we'll see you guys next week. For Money, I'm Chris. This has been Chargers Weekly. Chargers Weekly.